Thank you. Um, maybe I can just begin by saying this is actually an abridged uh, version of uh, a chapter that I have uh, coming out in this, this book. I've taken the liberty of uh, distributing a few flyers for it, severally seeking SART. That will be out from Cambridge <coughs> Scholars Publishing in the next uh, few weeks and hopefully available in at least some good bookshops and some tax dodging internet retailers as well, one hopes. <laughs> um, so, you have to excuse me, I'm a terrible uh, cold at the moment, but um, try and keep the voice lubricated. <clears throat> so, the protagonist and supposed author of Sartre's first novel, La Nausée, is a, a man called Antoine Rocantin. After extensive travels, we are told by the editors, uh, Rocantin settled in the provincial Norman town of Bouville, where he kept this journal, i.e. the novel we are reading. It was found among his papers, presumably after his death, although this is never clarified. A freelance scholar, Rocantin, is researching a minor historical figure in the post-revolutionary period, the Marquis de Rollebon, whom he finds fascinating on account of his adventures, his charisma, his influence in high places, and his success with women, despite his ugliness. Rocantin himself, therefore, is presented as an intellectual and a scholar. However, one of the effects of the onset of his nausea, the physically felt realisation that all existence, including and especially human existence, is random, contingent and meaningless, is that he loses interest in study, which suddenly seems to him a pointless activity. Gradually, it gives way to the sensation that an ordinary piece of jazz music, which recurs like a leitmotif throughout, is worth more in its purity, harmony and necessity than any amount of theoretical learning. Rocantin's conversion from a conventional scholarly mindset towards one that is explicitly hostile to the West European post-Enlightenment humanistic tradition is catalyzed by a secondary figure who is in one sense a caricature of the pre-converted Rocantin. This quasi-anonymous character is the amateur scholar par excellence, the autodidact, the self-taught man. He is a petty employee in this drab provincial town who spends his evenings in the municipal library, doggedly reading his way through the entire stock of books, alphabetically by author, noting down maxims that apparently encapsulate some gem of civilised wisdom. By this passive acquisition of a broad uh, culture, he expects to become an authentically educated man in the best sense of the Western humanist tradition. Rocantin's deprecation of this self-deluding enterprise reinforces his disillusionment with his own project and his concomitant contempt for all the prejudices of a civilised and, above all, bourgeois society. Just as he begins to see that privileged personalities such as Rollebon are, in fact, the historical foundations of bourgeois elitism, so he despises the autodidact's exaggerated respect for the received ideas of this tradition and his futile absorption of them. His disdain, alloyed with pity, reaches its apogee when he witnesses the autodidact being apprehended in the library for stroking the hand of a teenage boy next to him. As the autodidact is ejected amidst some violent confusion, Rocantin ruefully records, quote, He was only slightly guilty. It is hardly even sensuality, his humble, contemplative love for the young boys, rather a form of humanism, end quote. Humanism, interpreted literally as the love of man, would surely embrace pederasty, Rocantin appears provocatively to suggest. In this paper, I will explore the layers of meaning in this allegorical parody of the self-taught person. Does Sartre really mean to reduce humanism to a pointless pursuit synonymous with pederasty? Is his ostensible denunciation of learning per se a serious attempt to undermine a venerable European tradition? Or is it, on the contrary, an ironic vindication of the cultural originality that is repressed by conservative bien-pensant respectability? We learn that the municipal library marks certain volumes with a red cross, to denote that they may be borrowed only with permission. These include the works of Gide, Diderot, Baudelaire and medical texts. Books, quote, from hell. 
Sartre's name would, of course, join such illustrious company after the war when his own works were placed on the Vatican's infamous index. Although a secondary character, the autodidact appears on 50 pages of a 250-page novel, that's 20%, twice as many as the only other significant character, namely Rocantin's former girlfriend, Annie, whose appearances cover just 25 pages, a mere 10%. At the first mention of the autodidact, there is a footnote explaining that he was a bailiff's clerk named Augier P. That's P. Dot, dot, dot. This is the sole reference to his name, which Rocantin never uses. Sartre is fond of playing with names. As we know, the legendary but historical figure Augier the Dane, Augier le Danois, is credited in some versions of his legend with having saved France alongside Charlemagne, and in others with having rebelled against the great emperor. This sets up an ironic resonance with Sartre's autodidact, aspiring to defend France, Western civilization, and humanity itself by his dedication to the enterprise of absorbing the whole of human knowledge. Equally, the French pronunciation of this name is homophonous with the phrase O j'ai paix, meaning Oh, I have peace there. This interpretation also has an ironic side. The library is a haven of peace for both the autodidact and Rocantin, just as his grandfather's library was a haven and a source of ambition for the child Sartre. However, that peace is deceptive and impermanent. In due course, Rocantin loses faith in his scholarly project and abandons it, while the autodidact will be ejected ignominiously from his tranquil place of self-improvement. In like fashion, Sartre himself would gradually discover that the creation of leather-bound tomes, even with his own name embossed in gold on the spine, was not really a valid way to salvage a human life. The autodidact is a sort of non-person, whose acquaintance does not count in the context of Rocantin's radical solitude. L'autodidact ne comptait pas, he writes. We must wait 50 pages before he appears. In the municipal library, he expresses a respectful envy for Rocantin's merit in writing a book, as distinct from his own project of merely reading books. Having initially remarked that the autodidact's choice of reading matter, quote, always disconcerts me, Rocantin then realises that the seemingly random selection of subjects is explained by the names of the respective authors. Quote, it's a sudden illumination. I have understood the autodidact's method. He's educating himself in alphabetical order. End quote. All at once their roles are reversed. I regard him with a sort of admiration, writes Rocantin, as the immense breadth of the autodidact's undertaking betokens a strength of will which he, Rocantin, does not possess. Like the character Rastignac in Balzac's novels, the autodidact had thrown down a challenge to human knowledge and was slowly, obstinately working his way through it. After seven years, he has reached the letter L. In a few years' time, he would finish the last volume in the library and have to ask himself, what now? Viewed in the perspective of a disinterested humanism, Sartre's satirical scenario depicts contrasting approaches to self-instruction, each of which is futile on some level. Rocantin's increasingly detailed analysis of the life and times of a broadly insignificant diplomat in post-revolutionary France is a classic case of the academic expert learning more and more about less and less. Yet he clings to his research as to his very existence, writing in his diary, I mustn't forget that at the present moment, Monsieur de Rolleban represents the sole justification of my existence. End quote. This is a vulnerable place for Rocantin to be, as he realises a few days later, only the present is existence, and the past does not exist, which means, necessarily, that Rollebon does not exist. Quote, Rollebon was no more, not at all. This revelation means, in turn, that Rollebon can no longer be the guarantor of Rocantin's existence. Quote, I was only a means to make him live, and he was my reason for being. He had saved me from myself. What am I going to do now? (laughs) End quote. In other words, Rocantin's relationship with the Marquis had been a symbiosis, a sort of existential life raft, a means of salvaging his aimless life from the depths of futility. 
It had nothing to do with learning for learning's sake, nor with moral and intellectual self-improvement, still less with any practical aspiration to become a professional academic historian. It was, in effect, an attempt to justify his very existence, and so when he sees through this self-delusion, he finds himself bereft, no longer a human being so much as a thing. Quote, it's nothing. The thing, it's me. Existence, liberated, disengaged, flows back upon me. I exist. It's no exaggeration to say that the end of Rocantin's humanistic project is also the beginning of the end of his life. For the journal that will be, quote, found among his papers, posthumously we presume, records this loss of purpose, this destruction of his raison d'etre. By comparison, the autodidact situation is less severe. Whereas Rocantin gloomily envisages the day when his self-taught acquaintance will close the last volume on the last shelf of the library and wonder what to do next, the autodidact himself has no such anxiety. On the contrary, in his second appearance, visiting Rocantin in his boarding house, the bailiff's clerk questions him about his exotic travels, again with evident admiration, and sets out his own plans for a future beyond his bookish self-education. Quote, when I have finished my instruction, I reckon it will take about six more years, I shall join, if I'm allowed to, a group of students and teachers on a year-long cruise in the Near East. End quote. Travel, he says, is the best education. It will enable him, once he has read everything, not only to clarify certain details of what he has read, but also to experience the unexpected, the new, in a word, some adventures. This is a positive future prospect. Six more years of study, then a year of travel, complementing and consolidating the total of 13 years spent sitting at a library desk. The autodidact is embarrassed when Rocantin guesses at his method, yet inflated by a powerful enthusiasm for the prospect of travel and for the adventures it will inevitably bring, he quickly recovers his composure. And again, it is Rocantin who, having already travelled widely and graduated, so to speak, from reading to writing, expresses misgivings about the autodidact's connection of the process of learning with the experience of living. Once he's got rid of his visitor, who leaves delighted with his pockets stuffed full of postcards, pictures and photos, Rocantin reflects that he, Rocantin, has not had any adventures this is not a cause of any regret, it is simply a matter of fact. Quote, even if it was true that I'd never had any adventures, what could it possibly matter to me? It occurs to him that for the most banal event to become an adventure, it is necessary and sufficient that you begin to tell it. People are natural storytellers, he claims, surrounded by their own stories and the stories of others, and they, quote, seek to live their lives as though they were narrating them. But this is all a self-delusion. You have to choose to live or to narrate. By this strategy of subversion, Rocantin undermines any useful objective that the autodidact might lay claim to in his life's project. The conceptually random reading of the library's bookstock is no more coherent than the systematic archaeology of its archives for the biography of Rolleville. Both enterprises debouch into self-deluding storytelling, the fallacious creation of adventure. Yet Rocantin is conscious that by recording his experiences of nausea, he is already turning it into a narrative, and therefore catching himself in his own double bind. On the one hand, he sees that, quote, an adventure is at last happening to him, and that he is happy like the hero of a novel. On the other hand, he admonishes himself accordingly, quote, be wary of literature, I must write spontaneously as the ink flows without searching for the right words. The next episode in the intersecting trajectories of Rocantin and the autodidact is their encounter over lunch. This is arguably the crux of Sartre's undertaking because it makes explicit the conflict between the autodidact's orth orthodox humanism and Rocantin's intellectual anarchism. And it is notable both for its form, the range of style, description, dialogue, witty asides, internal monologue, and its content, inasmuch as Sartre is arguing with himself about humanist values. At first, the autodidact's humanism shines through in his altruism. 
Someone is concerned for me, wonders if I'm cold, notes Rocantin. I'm speaking to another man. (laughs) This hasn't happened to me in years. But his appreciation soon fades when the autodidact insists that he order for his guest the more expensive options on the menu, although these are not in fact what Rocantin wants. Meanwhile, he, the autodidact, orders for himself precisely the standard dishes that Rocantin would have chosen had he been allowed to do so. The conventionality of this well-meaning generosity is humorously handled, and it foreshadows the moral opinions that the autodidact will soon articulate. Rocantin is amazed to learn that the autodidact was a prisoner of war, 1914-18, because he has never imagined him as having any other persona than the one he knows. This experience has left him with some idealistic notions about the community of mankind, these begin to surface when he praises a sculpted wooden, wooden, <coughs> wooden palen, panel excuse me, in the Bouville Museum, the faces on which have, quote, a human aspect. Yet he laments that aesthetic pleasure is a branch of human activity that is alien to him and marvels at people who, even if young and ignorant, appear to experience it when they look at paintings, for example. He finds this fact devastating because, after all, he is a man and men made those paintings. This leads him to reflect that aesthetic judgment is merely a matter of taste, and tastes change with times. To record such insights, he carries a notebook with him, just as the juvenile Sartre had once done, in which he enters his maxims, which are naturally provisional, as his instruction is not yet complete. His eagerness to share his thoughts with Rocantin bespeaks a poignant need for affirmation from a man whom he mistakenly regards as a kindred but superior spirit. Pathetically, he takes the view that if his ideas have not previously been expressed, uh, then they cannot be true. If it were true, someone would already have thought it. In this perspective, humanistic learning is not so much an education, a leading out of the self, as a way of incarcerating the self in a structure of ready-made ideas. Rocantin intuits that his host shares the general delusion of humankind that each of us is indispensable to someone or something. This is the polar opposite of his own conviction that, quote, much as we might eat and drink to conserve our precious existence, there is nothing, nothing, no reason at all to exist. Predictably, the autodidact misinterprets this attitude as pessimism. Doing so characteristically, with reference to a book he has read, quote, by an American author entitled, Is Life Worth Living? No doubt that's the question you are asking, he naively inquires. Obviously not, thinks Rocantin, but without explanation. This misunderstanding launches the autodidact into an account of what the author in question called voluntary optimism. Life has a meaning if one is willing to give it one, but first of all one must act, throw oneself into an undertaking, and then one is committed. Rocantin confides to his journal that this is just the kind of lie that people generally tell themselves. And this is striking, because this summary of voluntary optimism, as you will already have noticed, because you're well ahead of me, is not far from the line of moral thought Sartre himself would develop after the war, notably in his 1945 lecture, L'existentialisme et il humanisme, which would be published the following year without the interrogative syntax. This post-war claim for existentialism is perplexing if we identify Sartre as closely with Rocantin as he himself sometimes did, notably in Les Mots, where he he writes, I was Rocantin at the same time I was me. The more so as the autodidact's repost that man himself is reason enough for living provokes in Rocantin an adverse reaction that develops into a tirade. The autodidact's autodidact's love of men, he decides, is, quote, naive and barbaric, that of a provincial humanist. And he cannot resist pointing out that he does not appear to care much about men, since he is, quote, always alone and always with his nose in a book. The autodidact replies that he discovered his faith in men at the expense of his faith in God through his experience of the Great War and especially of the prison camp, adumbrating Sartre's own experience of the Second World War, realising that he loved his fellow prisoners like brothers. No longer feeling alone, as he had done before the war, living with unloved parents, another chime with Sartre, he realised that he was a socialist, and that other men are the objective of my life, of all my efforts, even if they don't yet know it. 
Here, Rocantin begins in his journal to inveigh against humanism in all its manifold and equally senseless forms, alluding to all the humanists he has ever known. Here comes a quote. The radical humanist is most especially the friend of civil servants. The so-called leftist humanist is chiefly concerned to defend human values. He belongs to no party because he does not want to betray the human. But his sympathies are with the humble. It is to the humble that he dedicates his fine classical culture. The communist writer loves men since the second five-year plan. The Catholic humanist, the late arrival, the Benjamin, speaks of men with an air of wonderment. The humanist philosopher is like an elder brother with a sense of his responsibilities. The humanist who loves men as they are and the one who loves men as they ought to be. And so he rants on, end of quote, of course, and so he rants on about the humanists who want to save men with their agreement and those who want to save them in spite of themselves. Humanists of new myths and old, humanists attached to life and others to death, humanists full of joy and others of doom. Rocantin concludes this scathing and caricatural litany by cynically observing that these different types of humanists all hate each other, of course, but, quote, only as individuals, naturally, not as men. Ingenuously, however, the autodidact supposes that Rocantin must share his feelings of love for mankind, given that in his research he serves the same cause in his own way. And yet he is baffled by Rocantin's reply that he writes merely for the sake of writing. He speculates that he is perhaps a misanthrope, uh, since he is not a humanist, this being the humanist's way of retrieving the anti-humanist for membership of the species loved by the humanist. But Rocantin refuses to be classified. I will not commit the folly of describing myself as anti-humanist. I am not a humanist, that's all. He now realises that his resistance makes the autodidact, this maniac, as he now calls him, hate him. The latter, nevertheless, continues trying to persuade him that they both love mankind in general and their fellow diners in particular, despite Rocantin's continued protests. Finally, this dialogue of the deaf culminates for Rocantin in an overwhelming sense of being superfluous and and in his worst ever attack of nausea. The blinding revelation that this sickness is the consciousness that he exists, the world exists, and he knows that the world exists, that's all. In short, the archetypal existential crisis. Paradoxically, Sartre was himself a classic intellectual, as we know, and on one level the autodidact is as much a self-parody as is Rocantin. Mesmerised, much like the autodidact, by the bookshelves of a library, his grandfather's, he resolved at an early age to redeem the futility of his existence through philosophy and literature, seeing these as literally routes to salvation. This is why we can interpret this long scene between Rocantin and the autodidact as essentially a dramatisation of Sartre's own inner conflict pushed to two absurd extremes. On the one hand, the autodidact valorises an entirely abstract adherence to instruction and erudition for their own sake, to a theoretical humanism which claims to be socialist and in awestruck admiration of humankind, yet without making any attempt to traverse the gap between intellectual devotion and practical engagement with the real world. On the other hand, Rocantin denounces humanism without reservation in all its myriad forms, and especially the arrogance of its underlying assumption that there is something intrinsically and inherently superior about the particular existent thing we call man, whereas, in fact, man is merely one existent thing among numerous others. Rocantin makes his excuses and leaves the restaurant no longer a man in his imagination, but with all human eyes upon him. Quote, all at once I lost my appearance as a man, and they saw a crab escaping backwards from that most human of places. This encounter with the autodidact is decisive for Rocantin, who resolves subsequently to abandon his book on Rolleban and to leave Bouville altogether. It is on his last day there that he records the episode recounted at the start of this paper, namely the moment when the self-taught humanist, Augier P, shatters the peace of this place of study by yielding to the temptation to reach for the hand of a young schoolboy seated next to him. What Rocantin's journal provocatively calls, as we have seen, a form of humanism, inevitably causes the autodidact's edifice of civilised self-instruction 
and humanistic socialism to implode disastrously. Quote, overwhelmed by shame and horror, this poor humanist, no longer wanted by humankind, has entered into solitude and forever. Everything has collapsed all at once, his dreams of culture, his dreams of understanding with his fellow men. End quote. Rocantin seems to regard this quite sincerely as a personal tragedy. He is not surprised but angry with the autodidact for having failed to resist like a fool, for not seeing the risk he was running. He even takes his part against the officious, bullying little Corsican librarian, whom he restrains forcibly from striking the autodidact for a second time. He's evidently moved by the plight of this man, whose entire life's project has been destroyed by a moment's indiscretion. I shall never again be able to come back here, laments the autodidact, refusing Rocantin's compassionate offer of help on the steps of the library and walking away alone. In this final encounter, therefore, the humanism of the autodidact is subverted into pederasty, whilst the anti-humanism or non-humanism of Rocantin is converted into sympathy. How can we interpret this surprising but mutually unsatisfactory conclusion to their curious relationship? One possible interpretation is that whilst mocking his own immature perspective upon a humanistic education in the personal histories of Rocantin and the autodidact, Sartre is critiquing not so much a classic intellectualist stance in the humanistic moral tradition as his character's failures to put their learning to any use. Rocantin abandons his research on Rollebon, sets off for Paris with the vague notion of writing a novel, which we infer is never written because it is not reported as found amongst his papers, unless, of course, it is La Nose itself. And the autodidact, whose project was never anything than passive, circular and solipsistic, will be denied even the possibility of pursuing that goal following his disgrace and expulsion from the library. Paradoxically, that condemnation stems from his having acted for once upon an impulse that was deeply human yet unintellectual, a sexual impulse that Rocantin calls, without any apparent irony, scarcely even sensuality, rather a form of humanism. Implicitly, therefore, the most human side of the autodidact's humanism is punished as he is expelled forever from the haven of the library like Adam from the Garden of Eden. Equally, the non-humanism of Rocantin is spurned in its most humane manifestation and his newly awakened social consciousness explicit in his lengthy denunciation of the bourgeois bastards immortalised in the Bouville Museum is sublimated into the aesthetic aspiration to write a novel to create a necessary artefact. In a sense, Sartre's post-war career was largely devoted to trying to redeem his own ineluctable predestined place in the world as a classic bourgeois intellectual. The project of his philosophical come political periodical, Les Temps Modernes, founded in the post-war period with Simone de Beauvoir and Maurice Merleau-Ponty, was entirely concerned with translating ideas into words and words into actions that would affect a change in the world. A project, one might say, to make the autodidact useful, to turn him from a mere self-taught humanist into an intellectuel engagé, a committed intellectual, or equally to redeem Rocantin from the self-serving ambition to create a work of art whose abstract perfection and necessity would confer a justification upon his life. In short, Sartre does not decry humanistic culture per se in La Nose, but rather learning for learning's sake. He is by implication, and perhaps almost inadvertently, making a case for the application of learning in the real world. He is paving the way for the conversion of the philosopher who would claim, just a few years later and after his experience of the war, that existentialism is a humanism. That is to say, a new humanism, one that is distinct from classic humanism, that posits man as an end in himself. This is a quotation from Existentialism is a Humanism. The existentialist will never take man as an end because he is always to be made. The cult of humanity results in fascism. That is a humanism we want no part of. But there is another sense of humanism, which means basically this. Man is constantly outside himself, and it is in projecting himself and losing himself outside of himself that he causes man to exist. And moreover, it is by pursuing transcendent goals that he can indeed exist. 
This liaison between transcendence as constitutive of man and of the subjectivity in the sense that man is not enclosed in himself but always present in a human universe, that is what we call existentialist humanism. Humanism because we remind man there is no other lawmaker but himself and it is in his state of abandonment that he will decide who he is, end quote. Whether he knew it at the time or not, Sartre's excoriation of classic humanistic learning as embodied in the autodidact and Rocantin's categorical denunciation of humanist ethics, a theory which takes man as an end and, uh, and a superior value, this humanism is absurd, prepared the ground just pre-war for his post-war turn towards a new definition of humanism. And that new definition enabled Sartre in existentialism to appropriate and reform an ancient and venerable philosophical tendency, thereby establishing a cultural hegemony that would extend well beyond the frontiers of France and endure for at least a quarter of a century. Thank you for your attention.